Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. I want to welcome you all to our service of worship this morning. A special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We want to welcome you. Um, those of you joining us in person, we welcome you as well. If you would take the uh, originals of Friendship, those of you who are in person, those burgundy folders, open them up, put your name and other information you share, pass them about down the pew if there's others in the pew, and back to the center aisle, um, and you can greet each other by name at the end of our service. Those of you joining us online, if you go to our website, betprez.org slash connect and fill out the connection card, we would greatly appreciate it, just uh, knowing who's uh, joining us in worship. If you are a first-time visitor, first-time guest with us this morning, we want to, uh, to uh, honor you with a donation in your name. Um, and so what we're asking you to do is stop by the, uh, the welcome table. Um, and uh, pick out one of our charities that we, we give to, and we will uh, give a, a donation uh, in your honor to them. And so uh, join us uh, for that. There's uh, printouts of the announcements and uh, the prayer list in the back, uh, just as you came in the sanctuary. Um, we're trying to be good stewards of, of all of our resources, and so we're trying to cut back on paper, and, and we're not going to be doing a paper bulletin anymore, but we still want you to know, you know, what's going on. And, and so uh, take those uh, um, announcements, and you can take the, the, all the activities that are going on, take uh, the dates and stuff home, transfer those to your calendar and that kind of thing, um, and so we'll use it in that way. Also, uh, if you're uh, giving, we have the uh, giving boxes in the back and just inside the, uh, 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 the sanctuary doors for, uh, for your tithes and offerings. Um, you have probably noticed that we've put the pew Bibles back in the pews um, and, uh, and want to invite you to, to use those. But I want to encourage you, uh, to continue to encourage you to bring your own, whether it's a Bible app on your, your phone or, or your tablet or bring your own physical Bible. Um, and those of you joining us at home, have your Bible there. Uh, we're trying, what we're trying to do is we're trying to encourage you to be familiarize yourself with the Word, um, with, with God's Word. And, and so you can take you and, and use your Bible. You'll know where, where things are in your Bible. You can uh, uh, mark and, and underline and those kind of things so that it becomes a, a text that is useful to you, not just on Sunday mornings, but, but um, always. And so avail yourself of that if you would. Um, we've been asking uh, folks to serve in by going to betprez.org slash serve and follow the links there uh, for, to volunteer for Sunday morning activities, uh, other weekday activities. Um, these roles are vital to the ministry and the mission uh, of our church as we seek to love all and serve all. Um, and so please check that out and, and sign up for those activities. And also the serve out, which is our, our traditional mission opportunities, um, being the hands and the feet of Jesus um, in our community. And so avail yourself of, of, those, of those opportunities as well. Um, the youth are preparing to, uh, uh, for their upcoming fundraiser um, uh, leaf raking. There we go. That's hard. Leaf raking is such a hard phrase. Why is that hard? coming up with that? Anyway, um, realizing that the leaves are just starting to fall. They're going to be doing this in November. But if you want your leaves raked, if you want the youth to, to rake your leaves, you better see Jake soon because there's a, there's a limited amount that they're going to be able to do. And so get on the list early um, if you would. And I believe that is the extent of my announcements. At this time, I want to call on our treasurer, Sue Kassat, uh, uh, elder, to come and speak to us um, about a moment for stewardship. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Sue Cassatt. I am happy to see you today in person. We have come to that time of year once again when we celebrate God's blessings and our faithful devotion of our time, talents, and treasures bestowed upon us by God. We formally call it Consecration Sunday. This year, our celebration will occur on November 14th. We can't talk about this day and internalize its importance without understanding its meaning. It's the act of or to declare something to be sacred. Merriam-Webster adds to devote irrevocably to the worship of God by a solemn ceremony. 
And why do we do this? Well, because we're followers of Jesus Christ who give unselfishly as an act of discipleship. It's a way people grow spiritually in their relationship with God by supporting our church's mission and ministry through stewardship. Stewards understand that God owns all, and we are earthly managers of doing God's work. There are many Bible verses we can refer back to. We can look at 1 Chronicles 29, verses 11 through 14, or Colossians 1, verse 16, Hebrews 13, 16, or Matthew 10, verse 8, or even Acts 20, verses 32 to 35, just to name a few. In 2 Corinthians 8, 2 through 4, Apostle Paul wrote of Macedonian Christians joyfully willing to give so liberally and abundantly to meet the needs of other believers, even when they themselves were suffering. We are also told what happens after we honor God's will. We can see that, that in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 8, 2 Corinthians 9, 10 through 15, Psalm 112, verse 5, and Proverbs 11, verse 25. I feel strongly about the importance of discipleship. It's written in the word of the Lord many times and presented in many different various ways. God wants us to get it. Have you ever had a teacher who repeated concepts during your school career? I have, and it usually means it's going to be on the test. It's undeniable. The other point that I had that I hold with significant importance is the fact that we are changing the lives of those we serve through our missions. For those sports fanatics, we call this a game changer for these people. There are people behind our distribution of dollars who have experienced unspeakable acts of violence, devastation brought on by natural disasters, crippling accidents, religious persecution, and insurmountable poverty. There are also people who are seeking glimpses of God's blessings as they discover Christianity and the everlasting love of Christ that we know and share. No one has ever helped some of these people whose lives that we have touched. Imagine the moment, that person who doesn't have to be afraid anymore. Can you put yourself in their place for a moment? This is the why. As you pray about what you will pledge to God for the coming year, and I think you should pray about it. I think that's an important piece of this journey. Remember these foundations and consider how you can honor God through blessings that you have to share. Thank you for letting me share a few thoughts today. May God continue to bless you. Thank you, Sue. As we worship today, we're going to be celebrating the sacrament of Holy Communion where we get to taste and see that the Lord is good. So I invite you now, if you're able, to stand as we join together in praise and adoration and worship of our Lord Jesus Christ. Join with me. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. Silence is 
strong and we claim your victory. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Faith be the song that overcomes the raging sea. Let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me. Let it rise. Let faith arise. Let it rise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lift him high. With all creation, cry, God, we praise you. All of you is more than enough for all of me. For every thirst and every need, you satisfy me with your love and all I have in you. More than all I want, more than all I need, you are more than enough. You are more than enough All of you is more than enough for All of me for every thirst and every need You satisfy me with your love And all I have in you is more than enough It's more than enough. You're more than enough. Last week we introduced to you a song called Where I'm Standing Now. And um, I just mentioned that there's a couple of great lines in this song that just really speak to me. Um, I'd like to invite you to focus today on the, uh, the, the chorus of the song where it says, I stand on the chain-breaking, miracle-making, powerful name of Jesus. And we have an invitation today, which is to place our trust in the firm foundation that is Jesus Christ, that we can stand on him. And we invite you to do that now as we sing together. Out of the wilderness Into your deliverance Look where I'm standing now These hands that once were chained Now lifted high in praise Look where I'm standing now Look where I'm standing now I stand on the chain break Miracle No better place to stand than on Jesus Christ. Led by your mighty hand into the promised land, look where I'm standing now. You 
you carried the cross for me now i am a child of the king look where i'm standing now look where i'm standing now i stand on the chain breaking miracle making powerful name of jesus on the body raising prodigal saving powerful name of jesus hallelujah i'm free hallelujah i'm free jesus my savior who rescued me hallelujah i'm free Out, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior, rescued me. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior, rescued me. Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, on the body raising, prodigal saving, powerful name of Jesus. I stand on the chain breaking, miracle making, powerful name of Jesus. On the body raising, prodigal saving, powerful name of Jesus. Please be seated. Indeed, we are free. We are free to approach, dare to approach the throne of, of grace, the throne of God, uh, because of, of the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we come to that time in our service where we do that, where we approach God in prayer. Let us humble ourselves before our God. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. <clears throat> we recognize, O oh God, the the discouragement, the, the sorrow, the sadness, and the pain in our midst. Like the psalmist, we pray that, that people who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. So we pray that those who sow in sickness would reap in health and wellness. We pray that those who sow in unemployment would reap in satisfying and fulfilling work. <clears throat> We pray that those who sow in disillusionment or depression would reap in clarity and hope and healing. Jesus, when blind Bartimaeus threw off his cloak and came running to stand before you, you asked him a very simple but powerful question, a question that intimidates us even today. You asked, what do you want me to do for you? We fear that question, Jesus, because we are afraid of all that we want. We are afraid that you won't meet our needs. We are afraid of disappointment. And so, Lord, let us stand before you now. Let us come honestly 
and authentically and answer your question, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, give us the simple faith and strength to answer you from the very depths of our soul and to tell you our most deepest need. All of these things we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> At this time, I want to invite the kids to come forward. And uh, where, Which side over here, Jake? Come, come on, right down here. You know, if there's not enough room in the inn, which the, the, the chairs, you can sit on the floor. You know, you guys, have, have anybody ever sat on the floor? Yeah, we can, there you go, man. It's not as, it, they're not as comfortable as those chairs. I will, I will give you that, but there's plenty of room, there's always room in the end. Good morning. So I've got a question for you all. Have you ever been told to be quiet? Raise your hand if you have been. Yeah, and some of the congregations playing along too. How does that feel? You, you have something you want to say? Feels thumbs down? Yeah. Not, not the best feeling, right? What do you normally do when someone tells you that? You cry a little? You be quiet or you go make noise other places? That sounds like what I do too. Sometimes, sometimes we have to be quiet when they tell us that, like it's a situation where it calls for it. But sometimes I talk louder and more or I just go somewhere else and make noise. And so uh, in, our, in our Bible story today, we're going to hear in a little bit, we're going to hear about a, a man named Bartimaeus. And he was blind, and he couldn't see anything. And so when he heard that Jesus was coming close to him, he shouted out, Jesus, have mercy on me. And what do you think the people around him said? Be quiet. Yeah, they said, be quiet, Bartimaeus. We don't want to hear you. He doesn't care right now. He's too busy. Uh, they probably thought that Jesus was such an important person that he wouldn't make time for somebody who wasn't important like Bartimaeus. Uh, they didn't think that Jesus would help him. They were embarrassed by his yelling, his nonsense. But Bartimaeus didn't listen to them. In fact, he shouted louder. He said, Jesus, have mercy on me. And when Jesus heard him, he, he called him over to him. And when Bartimaeus made it over to Jesus, Jesus healed him and made it so that he could see again. And so this story doesn't mean that you never have to be quiet again. Don't, don't take that from this. Because uh, there's times where it's important that we're quiet, where, so we can listen to others, so we can hear what's going on. But in today's story, it reminds us that when we need help, we shouldn't be quiet. We shouldn't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, we should make our needs known just like Bartimaeus did. Uh, we should call out to help from our family, from our friends, from our church, from our teachers, uh, from, from Jesus and from God. And when we do that, there's going to be people just like with Bartimaeus that say, be quiet, God's too busy, we're too busy, but don't listen to those voices because it's important to ask for help and God wants to help us God loves each one of us and desires to help us through whatever we're struggling with. And we are also surrounded by people who also want to help us and want the best for us. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for always being there to help us. And God, I pray that you would give us the courage to ask for help when we need it and that we would uh, be able to help others and rely on the help from others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we started this sermon series a month ago, uh, talking about uh, dealing with discouragement, with re recognizing that probably, uh, I would, uh, pretty safe to say that every individual here has been discouraged at some particular time in their lives. 
um, and especially in these last couple of years. Uh, um, and so we, we talked about giving you uh, giving some tools that, that we might have to help with this discouragement, um, trusting in God's promise. We talked about that God you know, tells us in, in multiple places, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And, and so trusting in that to help us overcome discouraging times. Um, we talked about being obedient to God and how that leads to faithfulness, which is an encouragement in discouraging times. Um, we talked about attitudinal issues like prayer and, and how uh, prayer can, can lead to gratefulness and, and, uh, um, and worship um, and, and, and being in the presence of God. How those things help in these times of discouragement. But sometimes, we get, we be, as we were going through this series, we realized that sometimes, you know, we can't overcome discouragement. Um, and it goes deeper. Sometimes... We can't handle it alone, even with those tools that we've been given. Sometimes we all need a little help. And so this morning, we're going to talk about that. We're going to wrap up our, our series talking about the fact that sometimes we all need help. And, and we're going to use this, this scripture from Mark chapter 10. Again, open up your Bibles, your Bible apps, uh, um, and uh, you take out the Pew Bible. Mark chapter 10, verse 46 through 52. Um, Bartimaeus' story of asking for help. As you read along or listen to the scripture today, you're going to discover that within it we have what has become known throughout our our faith as the Jesus prayer. And the Jesus prayer is a prayer that can be almost a mantra for us when we're trying to calm ourselves or um, in times of distress and when we want Jesus to know his presence is with us. So we read now again from Mark 10, 46 to 52. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of the Lord. And let us pray. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Help! I've fallen and I can't get up. Now, if you're of a certain age, you know what I'm talking about. Um, there was a commercial years ago. Um, and and I, it ran for years and years. And maybe it's still running. I don't know. Is it? Is it still? Is that one still on? Um, it's a commercial for those push button devices that you use. You know, you know, you wear around your neck um, to help when you can't get to the phone. The commercial was was aimed primarily at at the aged, um, at uh, the the disabled. Um, but but it, what it was it was this this senior lady. Um, on the floor, this commercial utters this call for help in such a campy, melodramatic way um, that it became one of those commercials. You know what I'm talking about? One of those, those catchphrase commercials that we just find hilarious, um, even though the situation and the device that was designed to do help in that situation is not funny at all. Um, that commercial is hilarious. Yet, yet it's, a, it's a pretty bad commercial. But maybe our, our, our laughter goes a little bit deeper than just making fun of a horrible acting, uh, the horrible acting. Perhaps the reason that we find this 
It's so amusing is because in general, we Americans think asking for help is something one does only in the most dire of circumstances. Now, maybe it's a guy thing, but I don't think it is. I don't think, no, it's not. It, I, I, it's our fiercely individualistic, pull yourself up by the bootstraps ethics made it, made it so hard for us to just even broach the subject of asking for help. Even though we, we, we now have a myriad of devices that enable us to call for help when we need it. Y'all got this on your person 24-7. How many of you got your phone with your, on, your, on your body right now? Don't lie. You're, I don't think some of you are holding out. Is it turned off? That's, I don't care. That no, doesn't matter. But we got these devices, right? Asking for help is a universally dreaded endeavor, writes M. Nora Claver in what we would call, we could call it anti-self-help book. Um, it's, her book's entitled Mayday, Asking for Help in Times of, of Need. It's an anti-self-help encouraging you to ask for help, right? Whether we're struggling with getting that heavy bag up in the overhead bin of that airplane or fixing that flat tire along the side of the road or struggling with depression, we Americans are much more likely to say, you know what, I'm good, I got this. Than, than saying, can you help? Unless it's an emergency, you know, unless you're on fire, then we'll let somebody help us, right? Well, if we fall and we can't get up, we're generally, would rather drag ourselves along the floor than inconvenience someone else, wouldn't we? And thus we reveal our true problem, our weakness which is the I got this mentality. Because sometimes, my friends, we ain't got this. That's our reality. In her research, Claver suggests a number of reasons that we Americans don't ask for help and, and try instead to constantly do it on our own. Number one, we were never taught. We were never taught how to ask for help, and we have few role models, if any. Our grandparents, the, the greatest generation, Tom Brokaw said, our parents, some of us, <laughs> that's our parents. For some of you, that's the grandparents. Anyway, they, they valued work and self-sufficiency to the point where asking for help was something you only did, like I said, if you were on fire or drowning at sea. The, the ethic for self-sufficiency has been passed on down to us generation after generation after generation. Number two, we worship our independence. That has become a God in our lives. In his book, Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community, Robert Putnam reports that Americans have become more isolated from one another as attendance has de decreased in clubs and community organizations, um, uh, service organizations, including the church. The advent of internet enabled us to pretty much do most things with a few taps on a key. We don't need to go to a physical store to, to get most of our shopping done, nor do we even need to be present in the classroom to get an education, which means we never have to interact with potentially helpful clerks or, or stodgy professors, like that guy right back there. It's, uh, we don't have to do it anymore. Bowling Alone, my friends, was written 20 years ago. So it's not a new phenomenon. But it has become maybe, in, it's become greater in these COVID crazy years. Number three, I don't even think to ask. We don't, it's not even on our, our radar. Kevlar says that we've been so like brainwashed by the, the, that American ethic of self-sufficiency that we don't even... Even asking never even comes to mind. We don't even think about it. We're so focused on caring for ourselves, for doing for ourselves, that we don't even realize when we need help. And number four, it's, this is a good one, it's easier to do it ourselves, isn't it? Huh? If you want something done right, do it yourself. 
It's a popular American idiom. We don't want to be indebted to anyone or be in a position to have to, to reciprocate, right? And finally, and I think this is probably the biggest when it gets all boiled down, is we're afraid to ask. We're afraid of what asking for help might say about us. We'd rather die a thousand deaths than have someone else think that we just can't do it on our own. Isn't that sad? In short, we're very good at trying to do it ourselves, achieving modest results along the way, instead of getting real help and making real progress. All the while, we miss out on so many opportunities for gifts, the gifts of, that someone else can give to us. Now add to all of that that I've just said, add to all of that the stigma of mental health in our society, and you'll begin to understand how difficult it is for someone who's struggling with more than simple disappointment or disillusionment, someone struggling, suffering with depression, how difficult it is for them to reach out and ask for help, the help they need to work through it. And so we come to our passage this morning. Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus has no such qualms about asking for help. And then the result of it is, 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 is him doing so, of asking for help, is, is, is miraculous. He's an example of the kind of richness and blessing that can come to us if we're willing to set aside our self-sufficiency, our egos, for a moment and seek help. Real help and healing from someone else. So there he was, sitting along the roadside. The crowd following Jesus and his disciples come by, coming out of Jericho on their way up to Jerusalem. And he heard Jesus was about to pass by. And without hesitation and without any sense of of embarrassment, The blind man shouts, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That's the Jesus prayer. And even the crowd around him thought it was scandalous, right? Sternly ordering him, shut up, be quiet. Much like we'd be mortified to let anyone publicly know that maybe we've got a problem. But Bartimaeus continues not only to ask for help, but to cry out for it. And it's through this story, his story, that we begin to learn some important principles that, that, that I think can help us when we need to cry out for help. The first principle is name your, name your need and vow to remain open to possible, all possible resolutions, right? Bartimaeus was a blind beggar, which meant that his only hope, his true only hope for a productive life was to regain his sight. He knows his need, but notice that he doesn't lead with that, with his need for sight, but rather he leads with his need to be seen by Jesus Christ. He shouts, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. And not have have mercy on me, a blind man, Bartimaeus seemed to understand that that his vision wasn't only clouded by cataracts or whatever it was that physically made him blind, but maybe also by his need for some spiritual healing. And he opens himself up to all of those possibilities that his healing might be physical and spiritual with an outside chance that it might just be both. Asking for help, my friends, begins with when we acknowledge, first of all, that we have a problem, the presenting problem, but there also might be some underlying issues. And while we may be, appear to be fine on the surface, we know that there are other needs lurking down in there, isn't there, other, underneath. And thus, the more we try to hide it, the more insidious it becomes to get help Be it physical or spiritual or psychological, we need first to name it, to name the issue. Bartimaeus was eager for whatever help that Jesus was able to give. Are we open? 
Are we open to the possibilities that we can be healed by Jesus or by those others that Jesus can send to us to help us? Are we open to it? The second principle, take a leap of faith and ask. We have to believe. We have to believe that that we are qualified for help before we ask, before we can ask. Bartimaeus believed that he was worthy of help, not because he was someone special. He was worthy of help because he was a child of God. We are children of God, a God who loves us. So when Jesus hears his, his cries, he, sa- he, he says, call him, call him here. Bartimaeus responds by throwing off his cloak, leaping up to meet the one who could help him. He puts himself in a position to receive help. He risks further embarrassment in order to get a closer look at this Jesus. That is an act of faith. Bartimaeus thinks to ask, and asking is the key to receiving anything that we might need. In fact, Jesus, he tells his own disciples, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it. Not that you will receive it, you have received it, and it will be yours, he says in Mark chapter 11. In in James, the book of James, James writes, we do not have because we do not ask. Asking God for what we need in prayer and asking others for what we need in person opens those doors to healing and wholeness. Jesus' response to Bartimaeus is a question, a question of invitation. He asks, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus replies, teacher, Let me see again. What do you want me to do for you? Can you imagine Jesus asking you that question right now, today? What would be your response? I got this, Jesus. We're all good. No worries. Right? No, I hope not. What's your deepest need? What are your deepest needs that you haven't asked Jesus or anyone else to help you with. How might you take this leap of faith and ask, believing that, that, that you, first of all, you're worthy and that you will receive all that you need and more. Jesus tells Bartimaeus, go, and your faith has made you well. Faith can make us well, too. We may not receive precisely what we want, but we can be assured that Jesus is ready to supply our need. Faith is a catalyst for asking, and asking is the key for healing. Third principle, be grateful. Just be grateful. One of the keys to asking and receiving help is gratitude. When we have that attitude of gratitude, it tends to shake us out of our, our self-sufficiency and allows us to celebrate what others have done for us. In a way, giving thanks is that, that substance that unfreezes the wheels, that drives community and enables us to acknowledge our dependence on God, our dependence on one another. When Bartimaeus received his sight, his first action was to follow Jesus up that road to Jerusalem. Bartimaeus is happy to go along, grateful for Jesus, for all that he has done. Now his gratitude is not merely words, but the action of a follower. He cannot reciprocate. There's nothing he can do to reciprocate what Jesus has done for him. And so instead he gives him his life as a response. Now we know, we know how good it feels to receive gratitude when we've done some some service to others, right? And it can feel just as good to give gratitude when someone has done something for us. And, And I'm not talking about quid pro quo stuff here. It's not you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. But rather, it is the simple act of saying thank you. Thank you. 
when we develop an, a discipline of gratitude, of, of asking for and giving help, it all becomes so much easier. Friends, we live in a world that has indeed fallen and can't get up, not on its own. Many of us have fallen too. And there are times when we need help in order to stand again. So let us not be afraid to ask for that help. Let us have faith and let us be grateful to God and to to those whom God will put in our lives that, that, that can help us in these times of need. Let us be thankful for the people who have already been there and helped us on God's behalf. Amen. I've carried a burden too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. I see it now, I'm laying it down, and I know that I need you. Run to the Father, I fall into grace, I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. You saw my condition, had a plan from the start. Your son Redemption, Christ for my heart. I don't have a context for that kind of love. I don't understand, I can't comprehend. All I know is I need you. I run to the fire. To grace, I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I'll run to the Father again and again and again. I 
run to the Father again and again. I run to the Father. I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding. No reason to wait. My heart found a surgeon. My soul found a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again. It all started last night as you were going to bed. World Communion. Asian churches began to share bread and wine. Churches in China met in secret. Churches in the Middle East, some, some who had been saved with a dream of Jesus, met under the watchful eye of their governments as they celebrated the Eucharist. In Europe, Christians gathered in churches that used to be much fuller than they are now. They celebrated the Lord's Supper. In Africa, the sacrament was celebrated in incredibly, uh, incredible numbers, growing numbers of Christians, many of whom bore the scars of persecution as they communed together. Those celebrating came from from all different, east and west, north and south, they were Presbyterian and Methodist and Catholic and Lutheran, Pentecostal, Baptist, thousands of other denominations and non-denominations. Christ followers met both in public and in homes and in secret. Some met with freedom while others gathered under the threat of persecution and death. Some take the sacrament today with organ music and praise band and others with simple singing or some in utter silence in wealthy churches and those desperate in poverty. The sacrament is observed today in churches and in homes and huts and in God's glorious creation under trees. The seal of the covenant is experienced. The bread is given to people who will overeat all day long and to those who have no idea where their next meal is coming from. But the one thing in common is that we all come to this table, the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. In many different languages, by ordained clergy and lay pastors, something like these words are spoken this day. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took the bread and after giving thanks to God for it, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Take and eat. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood. Every time you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. The, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation, take and drink. And every time we eat this bread, and every time we drink from this cup, we proclaim Christ's life, death, and resurrection until he comes again in glory. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for the nourishment that we have received at your table. 
May we be strengthened and challenged by all who have shared in this meal, both here and around the world. May we be sustained in our struggle by these elements, drawing strength from this divine feast. And may we carry in our hearts the life and the peace embodied in this bread and cup, that we might become the message of hope and reconciliation to a desperate and hurting world. Send your spirit to strengthen us in our love for one another and all of creation, that your table of hope and reconciliation and fellowship might be at the center of our thoughts and of our actions. Amen. I invite you to stand as we worship together. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit to rest and abide with you all this day and forevermore. Amen.